Last week, we took a slight detour to celebrate the end of our year-long every member mission trip. But this week, we are back on the road with Jesus, listening to everything He says, watching everything He does, walking with Him every step of the way on this long journey to Jerusalem, which we sometimes call the travel narrative in Luke's Gospel. It begins in chapter 9, verse 53. It continues all the way through to chapter 19, verse 27. We are just about halfway there today. Beginning chapter 15, which opens with the news that all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and that the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, I'm aware that last Sunday there was someone in worship who had never been to church before, someone who might not know who the scribes and Pharisees were, maybe not even the sinners and tax collectors. So I want to make this just as simple as I can for everybody's sake. Luke tells us that there was one group of people gathering around Jesus to hear what he had to say, and another group of people who didn't care for that at all. You don't have to know much about the Bible to understand the way that works. If Luke had said that all the Democrats were drawing near to Jesus to listen to him and the Republicans were grumbling and saying, this man welcomes Democrats and eats with them, you would get it. <laughs> Those of you who are from Virginia would probably get it if Luke said, now, all the Hokies were drawing near to Jesus to listen to him, and the Wahoos were grumbling and saying, this man welcomes Hokies. You almost have to understand that rivalry between the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech to know what Luke is talking about in that particular version, the new revised Virginia version of the Scriptures. But here he says that there were sinners tax collectors gathering around Jesus, and there were scribes and Pharisees who were grumbling. Why was that? Let me see if I can give you a little bit of background. You know how Christians are divided into all kinds of denominations. There are Baptist and Methodist, Presbyterians and Episcopalians. The Pharisees were like that. They were a denomination of first century Jews, especially intent on keeping the law of Moses, all 613 rules. And they spent a lot of time with the scribes because the scribes were experts in the law of Moses. They know, knew just how far you could walk on the Sabbath day without breaking the law. They knew just how much firewood you could carry. The Pharisees kept them close because what the Pharisees wanted to do was to keep the law of Moses scrupulously. We sometimes give them a hard time, but really, in the Gospels, the scribes and the Pharisees were the good guys. If they were in a Western movie, they would be the ones wearing the white hats and not the black hats. Now, the sinners and tax collectors on the other hand, were not the good guys, at least not as far as the scribes and Pharisees were concerned. I probably don't even need to explain to you why they didn't care for the tax collectors. You probably don't either. Uh, but Alan Culpepper explains that the tax collectors in this story were actually toll collectors who paid the Roman government for the privilege of collecting tolls. The system was open for abuse and corruption. These people would set up their toll booths by the side of the road, and they would charge just as much as they could get away with. Usually, they were not from the same neighborhood as the people they taxed, and for that reason, they didn't care how much they charged them. They only cared about getting rich, or at least that was their reputation. As far as the sinners, in this story are concerned. Culpepper says they would have included not only persons who broke the moral laws, but also those who did not maintain the ritual purity practiced by the Pharisees. 
That word Pharisee is derived from the Hebrew word parash, which means to separate. The Pharisees tried to separate themselves from anything unclean or impure. That's the way they lived their lives. And they certainly tried to keep themselves separate from the kinds of sinners and tax collectors who were gathering around Jesus. I want to take a closer look at the word sinner, the way they used it then, the way we use it today. In this passage, Luke uses the Greek word hamartaloi, which comes from the verb hamartano, which means literally to miss the mark. Maybe you can picture an archer pulling back his bow, aiming the arrow at a target, letting it fly, and missing the bullseye by a good two feet. It's not that he wasn't aiming at it. It's that he didn't hit it. And a lot of us are precisely that kind of sinner. It's not that we're going in the other direction from Christianity. We are trying to be good Christian people. We aim at that target over and over again, but we often miss the mark. We are sinners in that sense. But I need to tell you something about sin. I don't want to say too much because I'm planning to preach a whole series in March called Taking Sin Seriously, and I don't want to give it away here or now. But there is one thing about sin that seems to have been true from the very beginning, and that is this. Sin separates. You remember the story about Adam and Eve in the garden? God told them they could eat fruit from any tree, but not that tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat from the fruit of that tree, God said, you will surely die. But then Eve looked at the fruit, and it looked so beautiful, and the serpent said to her, you won't die. So she took some fruit, she ate it, she gave some to Adam, her husband, he ate it. And when they were finished, their eyes were opened, and they saw that they were naked, and they were ashamed, and they hid themselves from God. And in the cool of the evening, God came walking in the garden looking for Adam and Eve. And it can almost break your heart to think of him calling out their names. Adam, Eve, where are you? And it was the longest time before Adam finally blurted out, we're here, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten the fruit of that tree? And then, of course, it all came out into the open. But notice that God didn't hide Himself from Adam and Eve when they sinned. They hid themselves from God. And this is often how it is for us. When your mother tells you not to do something, and you do it anyway, you are not eager to face her afterwards. She might not know about it, but you do. And because you do, you hide yourself. You have this fear that if she looked into your eyes, she would know right away what you had been up to. Mothers seem to have that ability. When you get a little older, when you do something that God told you not to do, you might behave in the same way. You might hide yourself from God. You might stay out of church for a while because even though you can't imagine that God doesn't know what you did, you don't want to go to a place where His name is invoked, where people will look into your eyes and see into your soul. You might be afraid that if they do, they will know what you've been up to. Sin separates it separates us from God. It separates us from others. When Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he might have added, sin is anything that keeps you from doing that. When he said there's a second commandment, so much like the first one that they can't be separated, to love your neighbor just as much as yourself, he might have added, sin is anything that keeps you from doing that, from loving your neighbor. 
could be a little thing, your sin. Could be just the point of the wedge going into the end of the log. But if you keep tapping on that wedge with a hammer, if you keep on sinning and sinning and sinning against God or others, that relationship will come apart like a split log. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There was someone you used to be close to that you are not close to anymore. And you may not even know how it happened. Some hurtful word, some thoughtless deed created some distance between you. And over time, through other words and other deeds, that distance grew greater and greater until one morning you wake up and realize you are so far apart from each other, you may never find your way back. The same thing can happen with God. It may be true that once upon a time in your childhood you walked with God in the cool of the evening. He was your best friend. You told Him everything. You shared your secrets with Him. But somewhere along the way, your paths diverged. You began to go in your own direction, seek your own course. And one morning you wake up and realize that you are miles and miles away from God with very little idea how to get back again. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them, the Pharisees said. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. These people are not sinners. They didn't set out to hurt God or anybody. They just got lost. Now they're miles and miles away. They don't know how to get back. Of course, that's not the way he said it. Luke says that he told them a parable. And we've been reminded just recently that when Jesus begins to speak in parables, he is talking the language of the kingdom. And what makes sense in the kingdom doesn't always make sense in the world. This, for example. Which one of you, Jesus says, having 99 sheep and losing one of them, will not leave the other 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that's lost? The answer, of course, is that none of them would do that. It would be foolish to leave 99 sheep in the wilderness where they could wander away, or worse, be attacked by lions and bears. Foolishness to leave your sheep in the wilderness while you go after one in the world? It wouldn't make sense. But in the kingdom, it makes perfect sense because the king of this kingdom doesn't want anyone or anything to be lost. And so the shepherd goes tearing off across the hillside, calling out for his little lost lamb. And when he finds it, he rejoices, lays it on his shoulders, comes back into his village, invites his friends and neighbors to join him. Rejoice with me, he says, I have found my sheep. Just so, Jesus said, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then he told the story of a woman who loses one coin out of ten, lights a lamp, sweeps the floor, turns the house upside down in order to find that coin. And when she does, calls her friends and neighbors together and gives a party that was probably worth more than the value of the coin. She doesn't care. I'm celebrating, she says. Come and celebrate with me. I have found what was lost. Just so I tell you, Jesus said, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And if you read on in Luke 15, you will read the story of a boy who got lost from his father, who went off to that far country and squandered his inheritance on wine and women and song, but somewhere in that place came to his senses repented, turned toward home, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, came running down the road, threw his arms around him, embraced him, kissed him, wept over him, and threw a party the likes of which the people of that part of the world had never seen before. All because his son, who had been as good as dead, was alive again. His son, whom he thought was lost and gone forever, had been found. Found. 
it's only a parable. But Luke would want us to know that when Jesus starts telling parables, he is speaking the language of the kingdom. And what makes sense in the kingdom doesn't always make sense in the world. This, for example, throwing a huge party for a no-good, shiftless son who has squandered everything. Or this, throwing open the doors of the church to sinners, to those who have somehow gotten lost from God and who don't know how to find their way back again. Or this, going out into every side street and every back alley of this city, looking for them, searching frantically, never resting until we find them. That sort of thing doesn't make much sense in the world. But it makes perfect sense in the kingdom. And if we are ever going to bring the kingdom of heaven to Richmond, Virginia, we will have to engage in just that kind of activity. Because the king of this kingdom doesn't want anyone or anything to be lost. And especially not you. Back when I was in seminary, I used to attend those chapel services religiously. They always had good speakers, and I would come and sit on the front pew of the chapel, right there where the good stuff came down. Sometimes they would have world-famous preachers who would come and speak to us at Southern Seminary, and one day I sat there and listened to Fred Craddock preach. Fred Craddock was, even then, a little old preacher, just about that tall. But he preached a sermon on this passage, and then he told a story about his sister. He said, back when I was a boy, we used to play hide-and-seek on those soft summer evenings when the shadows began to get long and the lightning bugs began to blink. One time she was it. And I found the best hiding place of all, up under the back steps of our house. I was so little, he said, I could climb all the way up underneath the steps, and she couldn't see me. But I could see her. I was peeking out through a crack, and I watched her going around the house, looking for me, calling out my name. She looked behind all the bushes, behind the flowers. She went down the path toward the barn. She walked all around the barn and looked inside, calling out, where are you? She started coming back up the path toward the house, and I was under those steps thinking to myself, she'll never find me. She'll never find me. And then I thought, she'll never find me. And so he said, when she got up toward the top of the path, I stuck my toe out from under the steps, and I began to wiggle it just a little bit like that. And she saw it. And she said, one, two, three, on Freddy. And he said, I came out brushing myself off. I said, oh, shucks, you found me. But then he looked out over that congregation in the chapel, looked out over all of us who were sitting there and asked, but what did I want? What did I really want? And I was sitting there right there on the front pew, and I knew what he wanted, and it was all I could do to keep myself from shouting it out loud. To be found, I was thinking. You wanted to be found. And then Fred Craddock pointed at us and said, the same thing you want. I could have sworn he was pointing right at me, and I very nearly burst into tears. Either Fred Craddock knew me better than I thought he did, or there is something in every one of us that is more lost than we know and more eager to be found. Shall we pray? Gracious, searching God, who calls our names in the garden, who comes looking for us when we are lost. 
come and look for us now and find us and welcome us home. Throw those parties you are so famous for throwing. Indulge us in that kingdom craziness you are so famous for. Love us like we've never been loved and let us find ourselves at home in you at last and forever. For we ask it in your name. Amen.